Hello, hello. Sorry it's taken me so long to upload. I've been sick and had my wisdom teeth out, so I haven't been feeling the best. But now I'm back to the Hunter Hunter grind. And I wanted to take a break from the character analysis and just talk about a fun and cool theory I came across. So I was looking around the internet for any ideas or answers that could lead to figuring out Periston's Nen ability. But I stumbled upon someone mentioning something called the Sheila theory. And oh my god. Maybe I'm just out of the loop here, but I've never heard of this. And with how ridiculous I think this theory is, I just can't believe I've never heard of it. But anyway, I do want to preface this by saying this is not my own theory. I want to give full credit to the person that wrote this, and I'll put the link to the Reddit post in the description, but the profile says deleted, so I don't know how to give more credit than this. I'm also going to say right now that this is not a theory where I'm going to try super hard to convince you. The only defenses for this theory I'm going to give are things said by the author or things that immediately came to my mind. This theory is just really, really fun and interesting, and whoever came up with this put a lot of thought and time into it, and I just think think it should be shared. So take this as a cool idea rather than something that's definitely going to come true or whatever you want to call it. However, regardless of some of the flaws in this theory, I absolutely love it. And I do think parts of it are very likely. I'm going to also say this right now, reading the Reddit post is going to be a lot faster. However, if you stay, I'm going to expand a little more on things, plus you get visual stimulation. Now, there's two chapters covering Kropika's backstory and how the Crota clan got massacred, and you need to know what happens in these to fully understand this theory. If you already know, I'll put the time to skip in order to get right into the theory, but if you don't, I'm going to summarize everything relatively quickly, rather than fully cover both chapters. So we flash back to a very young Karapika, who wants nothing more than to travel outside the Kurta clan's hidden village. But the elder won't allow it because it's too dangerous and he's too young, yada yada yada. Then we meet Karapika's childhood best friend, Pyro. He's very important. One day, they're wandering in the woods and they come across a lost, injured woman named Sheila. And just something you need to know, the Kurta and people outside their village do not speak the same language. But Sheila asks them for water and they eventually figure out what she means and they give her some. She takes a few sips and she's good as new. She says she wants to repay them, so she gives them a book. She then asks where she can find water and asks where the river is. They can't understand each other, so Karapaka goes and steals his dad's dictionary of outsider language so they can then communicate. They want to help her because she's hurt, so they hide her away from the village and they end up bringing her food and water while her leg healed. She ended up staying a while because every time she was almost healed, she ended up hurting herself again. But as she ended up staying, she told the boys stories of the outside world and how she wanted to become a hunter. But also, Karapaka and Pyro began began translating the book she gave them, which was about the adventures of a hunter. And some people think it's stories about the dark continent, but that's like a whole other discussion. Then, one day, Kravika and Pyro go back to the cave they hit her in, and she was just gone. But she did leave a note saying thank you and all that. Time passes, and Kravika is finally able to go through an exam process to be allowed to travel to the outside. First, he had to pass a language test to make sure he could speak fluently, which he completed in three minutes. Then he had to pass a test of basically common knowledge someone on the outside should have. He passes easily. And for the final test, Kravka had to go on an errand to a nearby town, but he also had to make sure he was able to control his anger so his eyes wouldn't turn red. The elder also had Kravka drink a potion that if his eyes turned red, they'd stay red for 24 hours. This way they would know if he failed and would then be able to relocate the village. Pyro ends up joining Kravka on the errand, and everything's going good at first until some dudes start messing with Pyro. Kravka ends up getting pissed and he beats the shit out of a dude. And his eyes also start glowing like crazy. And it's also interesting that it turns out that the elder had paid these men to try to anger Kravika as part of the test, and it worked. Also, villagers see his eyes go red, and they freak out, yelling at him to leave, and they throw rocks at him. They called him a red-eyed monster and an agent of the devil. Kravika thinks he's failed the test, but his eyes stop glowing. And it turns out Pyro swapped the potion, so even if Kravika failed the test, he could still pass. Was that a super cool move from a friend trying to help? No. No, no it was not. Anyway, Kropika is allowed to freely travel the world, and Kropika decides the first thing he's going to do is search for a doctor who can help Pyro. Because once Pyro had severely hurt himself, saving Kropika, but basically his legs are really weak and his vision is really bad. However, while he was gone, the Phantom Troop had found the village and horribly and violently slaughtered them all. 
And to this day, Kropika blames himself for this. And because it's a little important later, Kropika has collected several eyes of his clan. However, he's struggling to get any real leads. But he's then informed by Nana that the man with a very large collection of Kurta eyes is fourth Prince Saradnik. But not just that. It appears that Saradnik has Pyro's decapitated head in a jar. But yes, now you know all that, we can really dive into this theory. So I think this is absolutely ridiculous, and therefore, so important to mention. Essentially, the author of this theory said how they saw a post about how the massacre is Kropika's fault, because his eyes had glowed red in the town, and the elder didn't know. And that didn't sit right with them. They ended up thinking really hard about it one night, and they ended up having a fever dream where the answer became clear, and that answer is this theory. Now, this theory will have essentially four parts. The first two seem sort of unrelated, with the third talking about what the first did. So the fourth part will be just filling in some of the holes and making sure all of the ideas are connected all nicely. Part 1. So this person essentially believes the Kurta clan massacre was not Kurapuka's fault in the way most people think. And even though it's a little odd, the author starts straight off by saying that Sheila, the woman Kropka and Pyro met, was not only responsible for the Kurta village being found, but she later would create a new persona, that being Periston. So Periston and Sheila are the same person. As far for how Sheila changed her appearance, I've seen people say that Sheila or Periston can shapeshift, but that doesn't make much sense and is a stretch. Regardless of how you feel about it, considering what we know about Periston and the Hunter Hunter world, it makes the most sense that Periston is just Sheila in either masculine disguise or he's trans. And I'm sure all you guys are reasonable people, but just in case, there's no reason to think it's weird or impossible Periston could be trans, especially when we have Killa's sister, Aloka, who is trans. But I guess I'll also say that it's possible Sheila's just in masculine disguise. Or you could say it's the reverse, Periston was in feminine disguise as Sheila. But regardless, my main point is that the idea that Periston or Sheila can shapeshift just doesn't make that much sense. As for evidence for why Sheila is Periston, it's not the most convincing of things, but I do think it's good enough. Periston and Sheila do look very similar. Like they could be brother or sister, or the same person. Their body language also seems to be very similar. There's also the fact that when we see Sheila, she's wearing these animal ears that certainly seem like rat ears, and as we all should know, Periston is the rat zodiac. Also, there's the fact that Sheila wanted to become a hunter, and Periston is not only a hunter, but one of 10 three-star hunters. And I know that doesn't seem too convincing, but it's at least something. Now, time to get into Sheila's very suspicious behavior. First off, how and why did some random woman just happen to be lost with a hurt leg in the general area of the hidden Kurta village. What if she was just searching for the village in order to let someone like the Phantom Troop know where it is? Not only that, but when she asks for water, we only see her drink a few sips and she's just magically okay. It seems possible that she was okay from the beginning and just wanted to seem helpless. And I get she wanted to show her gratitude, but giving Kravika and Pyro a random book is really, really weird. Especially when they don't speak the same language and she knows this. And when giving the book, she has no idea they'll be able to translate it. The author also mentions the possibility of a tracking device being inside the book, but that's something that will get talked about a little later. But just don't go dismissing it yet. Then, we have the fact that Kravika and Pyro kept her a secret. Shouldn't they have told the elder they found an outsider, but we get this scene where all three of them are holding their fingers up to their lips, which is the generic way of showing to keep a secret. So what if Sheila told them, and or wanted them, to keep her a secret? What if she didn't want the village to know she was there, so they wouldn't relocate? And this way, she would have more time to scope out the area, now knowing the village was close. And yeah, she was super nice to these little boys that saved her life. But all that could easily be an act, especially if it's Periston, just to manipulate these boys in a sinister way. We also have the fact that somehow Sheila kept hurting her leg right before it was healed, making her stay longer. This adds to the idea that she wanted more time to survey or look around the area to find more information about where the village is. 
And maybe even how many people they had, how many grown men, how many women, how many children, who knows what she was trying to figure out. Also, if Sheila was directly helping the Phantom Troop, this would fit in line perfectly with how Krello operates. He pretty much wants to make sure that he's guaranteed to win before entering a situation, as seen best with the Hisoka fight, but in this exact scenario, much later, I'll explain why Sheila would be helping the troop at all. Another thing about her so-called hurt leg, when Kropka and Pyro come back to the cave she was in, they see she's left and they're surprised. They were surprised because they thought her leg still needed time to heal, kind of showing that she was faking her injury or purposefully re-injuring herself to stay longer. And the state of health she was actually in was purposely hid from Kropka and Pyro who assumed she was still too hurt to leave. Now I will say, there's no obvious indication that they were surprised. In fact, all Karapika says is, I'm sure it would have been hard for her to say goodbye in person, huh? However, I think this should be more interpreted as Karapika coming up with an explanation, like him being like, it's weird she's gone, but this must have been why. That she had to leave without saying goodbye, or leave without any indication that she was ready to, because it would be too hard for her to say goodbye to them. The author of the theory finally explains that Karapika not telling the elder his eyes turned red was not the fatal mistake he made, nor was it the reason the village was found. The village was found by Sheila before any of this happened, and Karapika's mistake was not telling the elder they found an outsider, so they could then relocate the village. So to summarize this first part, Sheila and Periston are the same person. Sheila's incredibly suspicious behavior can be explained by the ulterior motive of wanting to locate the Kurta village, and Karapika not telling anyone he found an outsider near the village was the true reason for the Kurta massacre. Part 2 like I said at the start, the second part of this theory seems to dive into something else entirely, but trust me, it'll connect. So the second part gets into the theory that the Kurda clan is from the Dark Continent, and the evidence is pretty fucking good. For starters, the huts the Kurda live in, as well as the birds they use for travel, can both be seen on the map of the Dark Continent. And something interesting to know is that both of these things can be seen very easily, assuming you're looking for it. Not only that, but the Kurda clan symbol just so happens to have the same basic shape as Lake Mobius, and that same shape has come up a couple times when someone is talking about the Dark Continent. And this isn't as convincing, but when the gatekeepers of the Dark Continent are talked about, we see a gate, and on that gate, it's argued multiple symbols on it can also be seen within the Kurda clan. Starting with the least likely comparison is there are similar symbols on Kurda members' clothing. Three members have similar, I guess, curvy symbols on their cloaks as the door as seen here. And in terms of this type of design, it can also be seen within the architecture of the Kurta clan. Then on Karapika, Pyro, as well as two other people, they all have this circular image with a dot in the middle, which is another thing found on the gatekeeper's door. Then these last two are far more convincing. So when Karapika is given the potion to drink, it's explained that it was a failed attempt from the Kurda ancestors to try to hide their red eyes. Although the experiment was a failure, this piece of information is very important for later, so just keep that in mind. But on the design or art on the bottle, although not identical, it is very, very similar to the overall design of the gatekeeper's door. Then finally, I guess the arrow shape on the door is pretty much identical identical to one of Karapika's chains. So with going off of the idea that the Kurda are from the Dark Continent, how and why did they come into the human world? Well, the author of this theory explains how pretty much every time humanity went to the Dark Continent, with the exception of Nedro and possibly a few others, they brought back with them a calamity. And the author says that the Kurda clan are not only from the Dark Continent, but are the result of an ancient calamity. I have to take a quick second to make sure we all understand Meteor City. Meteor City is more than 1,500 years old, and it's suspected it used to be part of a larger kingdom, but now it's nothing but rubble. So the theory goes that hundreds of years ago, there was a large and powerful kingdom that wanted to explore, conquer, or 
colonized the Dark Continent, where other expeditions landed and found Helbel, Ai, Pap, Zobai, and Baryon. This ancient expedition found the Kurda. Because they lived in huts and rode birds, they were seen as a primitive race. So the kingdom was like, yeah, let's conquer them. But as we know, the Kurda are capable of being incredibly strong Nen users, with their power being amplified by their eyes going red. So they were much more of a threat than the kingdom anticipated. This led to them retreating back into the known world. However, they were followed by the Kurda. And I quickly want to say, not only does the idea of calamities explain why the Kurda followed the kingdom or were sent by the gatekeepers into the human world, but the fact that I and Pap have gone out of their way to attack people in the human world adds to the possibility that the Kurda would more or less have no problem entering the human world to continue attacking humans. But anyway, the Kurda follow the kingdom back into the human world and war breaks out. This leads to the Kurda pushing all the way to likely the capital of the kingdom, which they destroyed and turned into rubble. This became Meteor City. The creator of this theory even says maybe Meteor City got its name because when the Kurda attacked, they used some form of attack that resembled meteors falling down from the city. But just to offer another explanation, these are ancient dark continent Nen using Kurda. So so if there are hundreds, if not thousands of them on the mainland, likely organized considering their intelligence, they could have easily destroyed Meteor City in some other way, still turning it into rubble. Also, if anyone has a problem with Dark Continent Kurda using Nen, you shouldn't. Especially with Nanaka, a Dark Continent creature we know is capable of using Nen, but also all the other Calamities very much seem to use some form of Nen, meaning Nen is something at least some Dark Continent creatures can use. And if the Kurda had been living there for god knows how long, I think it's perfectly safe to assume that they too acquired Nen. Also before moving on, I will say that I know it's kind of confusing or hard to believe how so many Kurda would have entered the human world, but until we know for sure how calamities like I and Pap entered the human world, there's not much of a reason to spend time thinking about how the Kurda would have done it. Because all we know is the vague statement humanity brought back from the Dark Continent, the five great calamities. So we don't know how the actually came from point A to B. We don't know if the Calamities were chilling on the boats with the humans on their way back. We don't know if they had their own way of traveling from the Dark Continent. And we don't know if there was some way of them like teleporting. And with the fact that I and Pap attacked people in the human world, it's more than just bringing back stories. With the exception of Zobai, which seems to just be the sickness that was brought back. So there's no point in wasting time thinking about how so many Kurda would have entered the human world. It would just work however it works for the rest of the calamities. So anyway, the Kurda followed the kingdom back into the human world and destroyed it. And then the Kurda split into two groups, those that returned to the Dark Continent and those who stayed. Some of them would have stayed because this world was far more peaceful than the Dark Continent obviously, and others would have returned because to them, that was their native land. But one of the main points of all of this is after this theoretical war, it would explain the intense hatred people have for the Kurda clan. It would also give a better explanation as to why the Kurda are hunted down for their eyes. Taking their eyes could have been seen as an act of revenge. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't make any sense for people to want their eyes just because they're seen as beautiful and rare, but I am saying that this theoretical war would give a better explanation as to why they're hated and hunted for their eyes. It's also very possible that the hunt for their eyes started off as an act of revenge, but over time became more about their rarity and beauty. The theory then goes on to say that after this war, stories about the power and the fear people have of the Kurda were passed down by generation. This hatred continued and could have been a reason for the Kurda clan's massacre. Something else that's interesting is when the spiders slaughtered the Kurda, they left a note that said, we reject no one, so take nothing from us. And the author of the theory says, this wasn't a message from the spiders, it was a message from the people of Meteor City. You see, Meteor City has become the dumping ground for anything from trash to dead bodies, and it also allows the stay of anyone who comes. And assuming this Kurda war happened, once upon a time, the people of Meteor City had everything taken from them. Thus, the message to the Kurda and any remaining survivors, we reject no one, so take nothing from us. 
However, I do want to say that this message could hold the same meaning but be directly from the spiders, because the core members are all from Meteor City. And I'm not entirely certain, but I think you could certainly argue that the Kurta Clan Massacre happened sometime around when the Phantom Troop was first formed in Meteor City. And it's something I'll get into later, but maybe the Phantom Troop hated the Kurta for the ancient war and what happened to their ancestors. Or they were influenced by stories from it. But to get more into the hatred and fear people have for the Kurda, this fear and hate is still very alive today. When Kropika was in town and his eyes went red, people weren't just like, oh no, it's a Kurda. They were terrified. People were shaking and even immediately started throwing rocks at them saying leave their town. A grandma even called him a red-eyed devil. This level of hatred and fear just seems way more deep than just ooh, these people are strong and their eyes are scary. The writer of this theory even compares the fear of the Kurda like monster stories people tell their kids and be like if you don't eat your veggies, the red-eyed devils will come get you. And if I made any of that a little confusing, what I'm trying to say is that the fear and hate people have for the Kurda seems way deeper than just they're strong and their eyes are scary. And a lot of this can be explained more simply in my opinion if there was a great Kurda war that killed a bunch of people's ancestors. And finally, the writer finishes this series of thoughts by saying he predicts on the Dark Continent, Kropika will end up coming across the Kurda that are still alive on the Dark Continent. Part 3. So the writer gets back to talking about how Sheila is Pariston and whatnot. They first say how it's important to know that Kropka and Pariston have never met. Even when Gon was on the brink of death, Kropka never came to visit him. And yeah, he was busy finding the eyes of his clan, but from a writing perspective, seems odd that he didn't come to see his friend when he's on the brink of death. Unless there was another reason he shouldn't be there. What if it was because he can't meet Pariston yet? That if he were to meet him, he'd recognize him as Sheila. It's also important to mention that although Kropika knows who Pariston is, to our knowledge, he doesn't know what he looks like. The writer also gets into what Sheila or Pariston's motive would have been to do the massacre or help with it. When talking to Jing, Pariston says how he loves destroying the things he loves or is fond of. But that's just the Viz translation. This statement holds a lot more weight if you take the fan translation, which says, When I'm hated by people, that's when I feel happiness, and I want to tear apart and inflict unimaginable harm to the things I love. Now it's up to your interpretation, but it seems like Sheila became very fond or even loved Karapaka and Pyro. They were taking care of her for days, if not weeks. They spent hours talking to each other and sharing information and stories. It just really did seem that she was fond of them. And if she were Pariston, then we know that she would want to hurt them in the worst ways imaginable. Now, I don't believe the author says this, but I also feel like it's worth saying that although the Pariston we know now might not act this exact way, I do think it appears he's evil enough to do something like this. And these actions could be explained by him simply being younger, dumber, and less in control of his emotions. Stuff like that. And at the beginning of his hunter or evil career, a game like Finding the Kurda was good enough, although later his games and vision would become far greater. But all this leads us to the decay decapitated head of Pyro with the eyes still intact in a jar on Prince Saradnik's throne. The writer says that it's very convenient that one of the two people Sheila came across and seemed to like has their head perfectly preserved in a jar. So it's possible that he was actually at the site of the massacre and he likely tortured Pyro. Sheila or Pariston was likely going to the village to look specifically for Kropika and Pyro, but when they only found Pyro, they had to find a way to hurt Kropika. So leaving his best friend's decapitated body would certainly be an effective way of doing that, and that would also hurt Kropika more than the survivor's guilt. Not only was he not there to protect his clan, but he left the village to save his best friend, and while he was gone, his friend was killed in a far worse way than he could have ever imagined. And I should have said this sooner, but yes, Sheila would have been there at the same time as the spiders, and I can explain how that would have worked a little later. Also, when Pariston talks about how he loves to hurt the ones he cares about, we see a doll with its eyes torn out, and maybe that's a reference to the Kurta clan and how their eyes were gouged out because maybe the last time he truly showed his form of love was when he killed Pyro. Then more evidence for Sheila's likely involvement in the Kurta Massacre 
is that in a report filed about how the scene was found, it stated that a lost female traveler discovered the clan. Isn't that incredibly suspicious? That there just so happened to be another lost woman in the woods right near the hidden Kurta village? So the writer of the theory says this was likely Sheila going back in order to let the event be known to the public and thus Karapika. Also, remember the tracking device that was mentioned earlier? When Sheila gifted that book to Karapika and Pyro, which was really weird, what if there was a tracking device inside of it so the spiders could easily return to the exact location of the village, or at least very close near it? However, even with this theory, that's kind of a stretch, because first of all, Kravika and Pyro didn't keep the book directly in the village, but also using the theory, Sheila would have scouted the area on her own and already knew where the village was and how to return, because she also went directly back to the scene in order to report it to the public. So the tracking device is more of a cool what if rather than something that should be taken super seriously. Part 4 now for the rest of this. Some of it was already said by the author of the theory, but also I'm adding some stuff of my own, I guess. Because what I'm gonna try to do here is try to condense everything I went over into one solid theory. But first, there are a few thoughts I had to myself that I wanted to go over. Those thoughts were, okay, so Sheila was responsible for the massacre and she was there, but why was she involved in the first place? Why were the spiders there? And why does Sir Eidnick have Pyro's head? And I or the author has decent explanations for all these. First one is that assuming Sheila is Periston, we know that they want to find a game to play, a twisted and evil one at that. So if Sheila was in Meteor City and came across stories of the Kurda and heard how much they were feared and hated, it could have easily piqued her interest. So she went out and searched to find them. Her initial intention would have been just to find them, but after befriending Karapika and Pyro, she ended up wanting to hurt them in the worst way imaginable. Wanting to hurt them would have led to the drastic decision of wanting to slaughter the Plan. And I feel like I shouldn't have to say it, but I'm gonna. Periston is not new to making drastic decisions. If he wasn't allowed to go to the Dark Continent, he was gonna release 5,000 Nen using Chimera Ants into the world. But anyway, Sheila would have been far too weak to slaughter the clan on her own. So she offered the spiders the eyes of the Kurda as reward for helping her, and also probably said they could take full credit. It would also likely be fun for the spiders. But also an alternative version of this idea is that Sheila came across someone in Meteor City who wanted the Kurda dead, so she took up the challenge as a fun game and offered to help, and this idea would allow the note that was left by them to be from the people of Meteor City. This second explanation might be more likely though, and it's because the core members of the troop are all from Meteor City. So maybe they grew up being told stories of the Kurda, specifically stories about how the Kurda killed their ancestors. This would give them motivation for doing what they did, and you can pause to read the description of how the Kurda were killed, I think it would be reasonable to say that they had some kind of grudge against the Kurda. But anyway, the spiders would have wanted to find the Kurda once they were strong enough, but once they were, they had no idea where to begin to look. And here comes Sheila, who either offered to help them find them, or already knew where they were and offered the information in exchange for Pyro being off limits. This would explain how and why the spiders and Sheila were together, as well as why the spiders left the note from the people of Meteor City. Now, as for why Sarainek has Pyro's head, I have three ideas. Sheila wanted someone untouchable, like a Prince of Kakin, to have Pyro's head so Karapika could literally never get it back. It's also possible that Sheila had her fun with Pyro, then left his body for the spiders to do as they please, and they ended up selling it to the highest bidder, which was Prince Sarainek. But a less exciting option is that it just adds a plot device for Kropika to have to or want to fight Sarainek, so him having Pyro's head doesn't really matter how he got it, it's just that he does. And one final thought on Pyro's head. We don't know for sure if the head in the jar is Pyro's or even a Kurda head, but considering it's on the altar with scarlet eyes, and it certainly looks like him, I think it's safe to say it's Pyro. However, I guess the question is, does he still have his eyes? And could they even turn red because of his illness? Anything's possible, but I'd say a guy like Sarainek wouldn't have anything on display unless he thought it was beautiful in a twisted way. So I don't see any other reason as to why he'd have the head at all unless the eyes were still intact, especially when the head is the centerpiece surrounded by scarlet eyes. 
And I just can't help but mention it, but there's an idea out there that the spiders weren't alone slaughtering the Kurda, but it wasn't Sheila that was there. It was Prince Sarednik. I just had to say that because it's a cool thought. Now to finally combine everything I've gone over to a solid idea. First of all, Karapika wasn't responsible for his village being slaughtered because his eyes went red in the town. He was responsible because he never told the elder he found an outsider. It was his fault because he trusted the wrong person. Then we have the fact that Sheila is Periston and is not only responsible for the massacre of the Kurda clan, but is likely the one who killed Pyro. And Pyro's head is now in the possession of Prince Saradnik. This leads to the likely scenario that Periston, Saradnik, and Karabaka will all end up on the Dark Continent together. However, I think there is a chance that it'll just be Periston and Karabaka on the Dark Continent because Saradnik might get killed while on the boat by either Karabaka or one of his siblings. Karabaka will not only have to deal with the man with the last remaining eyes of his clan and the head of his best friend, but he'll likely figure out Parison is Sheila. He'll realize that the woman he became friends with betrayed him in the worst way imaginable. And then to the importance of the Kurda being from the Dark Continent, this theory implies that the expedition along with Karapika and the others will come across the Kurda clan on the Dark Continent. And a quick thing that's important to know is Togashi was once asked what will happen to Karapika and the spiders, and he said they're all gonna to die. Now for a moment, forget about the spiders, and let's just focus on the fact that Karapika will die. Periston and Saradnik, or just Periston maybe, along with Karapika, come across the Kurda village. And with these guys being who they are, Periston and Saradnik will want to kill, destroy, capture, torture the people of the village. I also don't think it's impossible that Periston and Saradnik would be best friends. But anyway, at the same time of all this, Karapika will be able to finally meet his clan again, have a final connection with his people, and he'll also have the final chance to protect his clan from those who wish it harm. And considering Karapika will be killed, you could argue that he'll end up using chain jail on either Periston or Saradnik, but if we go with Saradnik dead in this case, then he'll use it on Periston. But if it does end up being both of them, you could say choosing which one to kill will be one of the hardest decisions Karapika ever has to make. I'd also like to throw the idea out there that the Kurda Karapika comes across Cross, might not like him because he's from the known world. They might look down on him because he's part of the Kurda that chose not to return, possibly being seen as members who betrayed the clan. So imagine Karapika gets to meet his clan again, yet they don't want anything to do with him. However, regardless, he still sacrifices himself to save his clan. Just a cool thought. But all in all, Karapika gets a final chance to meet and save his clan, sacrificing himself in an act of revenge. Now, that's all I got for this theory. And don't get me wrong, this whole theory is a big if. There's countless ways I could go on to try to disprove it. For example, I could say that Sheila being Periston based off similar looks and animal ears is a big stretch. You could say she was truly nothing more than a dumb, lost, hurt traveler. You could say the spiders killed the Kurda completely on their own, and they didn't need any help finding the village. You could say the similarities between the Kurda village and things found on the Dark Continent is purely a coincidence even likely because all life in the known world had once come from the Dark Continent. You could say there's no evidence for a war with the Kurda. You could also say the Kurda are solely hated and feared because they're strong and have scary eyes. And you could also say Karapika never met Periston because finding the eyes of his clan and avenging them was far more important than checking in on Gon. And I'ma stop there, but my point is this theory isn't flawless. But there still are parts of the theory I think regardless of anything are extremely convincing. I think Sheila being Periston is iffy at best, however Sheila having some kind of involvement in the massacre is highly likely because everything about her is so suspicious. The Kurda War is also very iffy, but once again I think that the fact that they're from the Dark Continent is extremely likely. But at the end of the day, think what you want of this theory, I just love it so much. I think it's amazing and I needed to share it, but as always, feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments.